why don't you guys show them the um, case you want to show them, and then we'll go from there. All right, I have an, I have a few still pictures of the case. If I if you guys allow me to share the screen, let me. Well, got, right. Do you guys do you guys see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so this is a 65 year old lady who initially presented with this hematoma at an outside hospital, and then um, this is the CTA that was done at, at the time. Um, at the time, um, it was it wasn't read as positive. And in fact, she was discharged um, and she got to us um, after the fact. So, you know, she, she got an angiogram, uh, which I'm gonna show it right here, which uh, shows um, this very small arteriovenous malformation here uh, with this draining vein coming into the midline. That's the frontal view. And this is the lateral view right here, showing this very, you know, a small AVM. Um, we, we did some supra selective, as I said, I just have some still pictures. I don't have the, the full angel here, but this is some supra selective. This is, um, supra selecting the inferior M2 branch distally. And then you can see there, um, some of the supply to the AVM, um, some normal artery right here. And then that, um, that draining vein, um, that we spoke about. Uh, and you have another one. Uh, that yeah, and then another one right here. This is the a frontal view, um, also very close to that uh, to that feeder. To show, him, the show him the feeder. Yeah, so it's a very small branch, and then distal to it, there is a normal uh, uh, supply to the parenchyma, to a normal parenchyma. So we did not embolize this trans arterially, and. This, we just finished this uh, 20 minutes ago. So the question now is given that she bled, obviously we do believe that she should be treated uh, to prevent another hemorrhage, uh, but should this uh, go for surgery, for surgical resection, or should we try transvenous embolization of this micro arteriovenous malformation? Yeah, you know, that's a good case. Um, <clears throat> obviously the the transvenous is very attractive here. And um, it hinges on whether or not you think you there's any indication to removing this hematoma. Uh, and how, I will how long ago was the bleed, Ross? It was, a few yeah. it was a few weeks ago. Yes. So that's, was that the hematoma now, or is that a few weeks no, ago? No, that's, that's the original CTA from when she presented. Yeah. She did not require evacuation and she recovered completely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I am becoming more and more of a fan of the transvenous, either directly or open transvenous assisted. Um, we submitted a paper that Dave knows about this, we call it Vortex. Um, and in, in this case, uh, it's almost ideal for it. There's just one vein, small nidus. Uh, if you can get to it, I will, I will give it a try. And uh, what's the worst that can happen? You can't get it, there's, you can go and resect it. I'd go for it. You put a balloon in the uh, arterial side, Roth, you know, proximal to the feet or is it too small? Yeah, the, the, well, it, it, it would be in the, in the inferior division of the MCA that we would yeah. put a balloon. Uh, we would be ready, you don't need in case it. we need it. You don't need I, it? I mean, you know what we've done, Roth? We've used transvenous spacing. Okay. Target pacing, rapid, rapid ventricular pacing. I mean, maybe you could do. That's, 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 you know, I think that's the uh, kind of more mechanical way to do that. I, I think uh, if, if you're, since you're not getting an isolated, I mean, a balloon has risk. It's a small artery. It's probably smarter to do it, much yeah. lower blood pressure. It's just it's uh, it puts a little more pressure on your you know the glue. You got to get it, and then you can stop pacing, and you have, then you got with a. With the balloon, you can deflate it, open it, and then, you know, shoot again if you want to use Onyx. But uh, I think transvenous pacing is probably reasonable. Although in reality, this uh, uh, nidus is so small and the feeder is so small that uh, we should not have trouble no. injecting through the venous side. No, you're not going to have, you're not going to need much. Are you going to, um, still, you I would just do the, you know, if you do the, the, the rapid ventricular pacing, it just it just takes this additional thing out of out of the equation, and it just uh, 
Fatty, would you do this open or would you do it, try to do it in the angio suite? This one is, is small. I'd do it in the angio suite. Yeah. I like that idea. I, I think surgical, it's going to be so hard to find. Yeah. You could be rummaging around an insula and yeah. it's not a great place to be. It'll be residual hematoma. It's going to be a mess. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to get your feet wet on the transvenous, this is the one. Yeah, we, we did, we, how we, what have we done? Two, I think. Two. Yeah. yeah. And they're very similar to the single draining vein. Yeah. And with small uh, so, uh, indirect or in passage supply. Yeah. We had Alex on last week and he's uh a real proponent of this also when it's but you got to select your cases to me i think the anatomy venous anatomy here looks very favorable for it you know let's do that roth okay Awful. i mean it got to the point now honestly whenever i get an abm the first thing i look at is the vein <laughs> that's amazing right i mean yeah so either open or endo here is a good one for endo yeah. Um, why don't you, um, we're getting some questions on our uh, Instagram feed. Um, I think we should probably um, explain exactly what we're looking at a little bit, Roth. You know, what side of the brain, we're on, where this, where this artery is, and then what an, you know, what an ABM is, uh, why, what transvenous approach is, why it's different from an arterial approach, what transvenous pacing is, um, what part of the brain you're in. And uh, then, then I think, because some of these kids, high school, college, uh, they, I think they benefit from a little bit. And we can use that to sort of triangulate it into the life and times of Fatty Charbel. So, uh, and also we can, Fatty, maybe I'll ask you to describe the, you know, this transition of treatment from, you know, surgical, you know, purely an arterial approach to this kind of latest, greatest idea of being on the venous side and why that's, Tra transcendent uh, right now in uh, in uh, ABM treatment. So I'll start with one of you and Yaf will start off with some of the hardcore medical stuff for the audience. So so the in terms of the for the audience, an ABM is an abnormal connection between artery and vein that should not exist that can predispose someone to have uh, bleeding in the brain. This is most likely a congenital lesion that, or, and, or very early in life in this person. They usually form at a very early stage in life. Uh, however, they don't manifest something later. There you have pressure coming from the arterial side, uh, going into a vein that is not made to sustain the pressure that can then cause uh, bleeding like it happened to her. Other people can uh, present with seizures, headaches, swelling in the brain, uh, and, and some people don't have symptoms uh, from it. And um, so, so since she bled, she underwent workup um, that discovered this abnormal connection and the supply uh, or the arterial uh, so, uh, blood is going into a, an artery called, um, it, it, it is the inferior division of the middle cerebral artery. Um, which is an artery that supplies a, a large portion of the of frontal lobe, a portion of the parietal lobe. Um, and uh, when we look at an angiogram uh, to determine if the patient should be treated uh, by endovascular approach transarterially, we need to look at the normal. And if there's a normal supply uh, uh, or supply to the ABM at the same time as uh, supply to a normal territory of the brain, it is too risky for us because we're going to cause a stroke if we try to close those arteries. We close them by injecting um, embolic uh, material that is liquid. It can be uh, NBCA and uh, butyl cyanoacrylate, which is basically crazy glue, but prepare it in a medical form so that you can sell it for more expensive or more dollars. And, uh, or, or it could be, you, or, or we sometimes use onyx, which is an adhesive material that also sees it like a toothpaste-like consistency that closes the, uh, the connections between the arteries and the veins. And in this case, it was too risky uh, for us to try to close it uh, in that way. So that's what we're discussing other possible scenarios, whether it's open uh, doing a craniotomy and, and, doing, and, and resecting the ABM, uh, or uh, transvenous, which means uh, going in the opposite direction, going from the drainage of the abnormal connection between artery and vein, going the opposite route and closing it 
in that way, which is a new way that we've been, when I say new, uh, it has been done now for approximately uh, six years or so. It has been uh, becoming more popular throughout the world as a way to, to deal with these type of problems. And so then when I went with basically the idea usually is we can treat these really three, four ways, doing nothing, leave them alone, and because th there can be a fair amount of morbidity. Another option is surgery, pure surgery, just remove them. The next option is called embolization and surgery, or even cure with embolization. Sometimes you can cure these with glue or cure them with a combination of glue and surgery. Then the last option was radiosurgery with either alone or with embolization. But a uh, fatty is... Uh, what did, what's your acronym, Fatty Vortex? What is, what's that stand for? You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Venous occlusion and the resect with total excision. Very nice. Yeah. Who Vortex. thought of that? So, uh, so it's the same idea. It's, it's going transvenously. I'm going to see if I can uh, show you a video. But it's the same idea what Raphael talked and uh, and you felt. So uh, it's like a river. The water comes in, seeps into little tributaries, and comes out the other way. And if you can just block it, then it doesn't flow in anymore. The problem is that if you block it too abruptly, then that river can overflow and and, and cause problems that way. So how can you do that? But what Rafa said is you go through the vein. If you get to it and block it completely all at once so nothing's flowing in so you got to do it all at once and be done with it if you can do that you really cure it in a very elegant way the problem sometimes is you can't get to it and so another a way to get to it is to go through the vein and and we can do it in the operating room so if you can't get to it through the groin through the catheter we can do it through the operating room and and if we want the pressure to drop a little bit and not be too high we can reduce the uh, we can reduce the uh, so I'm going to show you a video okay and that's called the transvenous rapid ventricular pacing so so a catheter goes through the vein do you want to take the screen over do you have a case to show us? I have it on my phone so I'm going to just try to show it on the phone and see if that works okay hang on a sec So you see the heart rate just dropped the to zero. The one is the heart rate that's going faster and faster, and the one below it is the line of the blood pressure that it goes down. Right. And then you inject the glue as this is happening. Yeah, that's better. And that's being done at surgery. You see, so, um, so it's just a neat way. You can, interestingly, by by having the heart beat so fast, it's as if you've stopped it. Yeah, I mean, I think this, it's, uh, this is a big wave. It's take, I think uh, we heard Jacques Murray, your conference, uh, he's really the one who's been pushing this. Even Alex Bernstein, who is more conservative than Jacques, certainly. Yeah. Uh, we, we've, we've done a couple of cases, the right case, then case selection is everything, just like everything else. But Jay, you joined us a little late. We, we decided that you're not going to operate in this case tomorrow. Sorry, so go find something else to operate on. <laughs> Rafa, you've already taken all the subdurals. What's left? <laughs> so, Yafel or, 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 or Rafa, can you, can, you show, can you show the video again one more time? This is uh, Matt Koch. He's our fellow this year, great guy. And uh, just to kind of show it to him. Yeah, sure. Let me just get the screen. Yeah, I'll I'll get the screen again. And uh, you want me to go through all the images again? If no, you, no, just just, just, uh, or just yeah. This just was the initial. Sorry. Sorry. That was the initial hematoma there with the CTA. And then this is um, the left internal carotid artery injection. That's the frontal view showing the micro AVM at the draining vein right here. And this is the lateral view 
showing the same thing. And these are supra-selective injections of the inferior division of the middle cerebral artery, showing the, the actual feeder going into the, the AVM and then showing the draining vein. So small, deep rupture needs to be treated, not easy to embolize transanterially single vein. No, I think, I think great, great. This is the time to do it, right? Great case. Well, uh, you know, we had this discussion earlier that um, in, in, the case, in the case where we treat it acutely, it's almost a little easier because you have the hemorrhage to guide you in terms of the location. Right. Um, I think finding this at this point, it's been maybe two or three months, the hematoma is gone. Um, it's a little bit more challenging uh, to actually find it within the parenchyma. But, uh, That's exactly what we were saying, Jason, before you got in that, uh, because it's been a few, yeah, it's been a while, so not easy to find. We were besmirching you before you showed up, Ellis. <laughs> 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 no, I think, Rod, um, Rafa called me about this case beforehand. I suggest he show it today, but the hardest part about this is finding it and, and knowing what you're seeing. You know, I've, there are times that something looks like the AVM and is that the vein? You know, it's one of those things that you don't really find until you know it's really it, but it, it can be challenging. And you're in the lady's left insula. It's not like you're, you know, in the right frontal lobe and it's deep. I think uh, unless you can put a marker there for navigation, which is hard to do, um, I think a transvenous approach is, this is ideal for that. This is what that, I think this is what that treatment is designed for. And uh, I think we should go for it. So good. So um, with that, I think that's just an example of, I think the way that we like to make decisions as a team, with, with, certainly with Atlantix and I know, Fatty, I know your group is very similar. Um, I think for the purposes of this conference, we were um, uh, trying to, bring to our students to an understanding of, you know, what it means to do what you do. And, uh, you know, partly is your story. You know, I think we're all interested in hearing um, about you as, a, as how you started. You know, I know, obviously you grew up in Lebanon um, and uh, with the trajectory you took to get to the United States, um, some of the decisions that you made along the way, which, which led to where you are today as far as your your accomplishments. I, I want to introduce you real briefly. Fatty is the uh, chairman on going now, how many years now? 20 years? How long have you been at UIC? 20 years? I've been the chair since uh, officially 2002. That was kind of, I was, you know, Fatty are, are not very far apart in age, but he's been a chairman since I think I've started my residency. I mean, since I started as an attending almost. And uh, he was one of the younger chairmen ever in the country in his early 40s right, or late, late 30s, you know, and he's been there. He's really a, a luminary um, in vascular neurosurgery. He's, uh, and to me, when I met Fatty, I, I saw someone who um, really asked questions and instead of just assuming the conventional wisdom was right, uh, went and solved things for himself uh, with new technologies, new procedures. He's also uh, just a phenomenal surgeon um, and I think that um, I've modeled myself in many ways after him. Uh, I think there are um, two kinds of leaders and we're gonna have a talk on this on Friday for the internship group, uh, North Star leaders and Gold Star leaders. And a Gold Star leader is someone who gradually gets smooth at the food chain by making friends and being in meetings and you know, bureaucratically getting credit for doing things and collaborating. It's sort of a conventional way of of moving up a food chain and a large bureaucracy and healthcare is full of gold star leaders. They're parts of, of uh, groups and comp committees, uh, different um, uh, organizations that, that, that promote each other. Um, but a goal, a North star leader is different. And a North star leader is someone who has a vision and has a question or a problem he's answering and creates an environment around him uh, to help him get there. And I think that uh, that's fatty is a North star kind of guy and he continues to be that person. And uh, I can't be more grateful to what I've learned uh, from him and what I've seen from him over the years. And you continue to astound me, uh, like how creative you are and just taking thing, new things up. And so how did that start? Was this something you were born with uh, as a kid? Uh, did, when did you notice that, decide, you know, when did you feel 
something inside you. I mean, it takes a lot to leave your home country and come to the United States. Give us some, uh, give our team here and, and our group some insight into what it takes to be Fatty Charbel. Uh, <clears throat> so Dave just finished introducing himself uh, as, a, as a North Star leader. Get out of here. <laughs> which he is, uh, he's my best friend. But besides this bias, uh, you all know him. I mean, Dave is a, uh, not only has all the attributes of a great surgeon and uh, everything that comes with it, the stamina, the athleticism, uh, but he wears his heart on his sleeve. And I tell you, I mean, seeing that show, that Lennox Hill show uh, and seeing you guys, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but um, you know, a lot of people change in front of the camera and, uh, and they just put on airs and stuff. Not you, uh, certainly not Dave. Uh, and that tells you a lot about the man. Uh, but also know how, I mean, when, when you're not around or Dave and I are together, that's all he talks about, how great you guys are and how lucky he is and now his goal is to have the best people that he likes to work with be with him and so really I think that in a way you know he was talking about himself and I and I and I mean it so we, we all have a story you know it's it's hard to talk about depends how how deep you want to go um, but I think everyone has an engine um, that that's got to propel them over time uh, so I was born in Lebanon and um, it took me many years before I could really probably talk about that. But, you know, what, I have a twin sister and, um, and she's my only sibling. And um, when she was young, when, when I started to be aware of what's going on, I noticed, you know, it was apparent as we started to grow up, become toddlers, try to walk, that she has a hard difficulty was... I don't remember that very well, but I do remember that her arm is like this. And when she walked her foot, you know, slaps and circumducts and all that. So she was born with a stroke. I did not know that until many, many, many years later. They, at the time they thought, well, her arm was wrapped around my neck and that's why it got twisted. And, you know, I didn't know anything. And then when I went to medical school, I started to realize, you know, I think she had a stroke. And uh, so that's part of it. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I gotta, maybe I could help do something to help her. And then, so I was interested in that. And so I did my training in a French medical school in Beirut. And that was uh, interesting in a lot of ways because also there was the war in Lebanon and there's a lot of stories there. But then I said, okay, I want to come to the U.S. and train and, and, and be really the first one in many generations. The only one that had done it before me was, uh, was Ray Sawaya. So he was a generation ahead of me. And Ray had trained on the French side and, 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 and came and, got, and was American trained. So I wanted to combine the two because they're a very different system. The French side is more the erudite type of thing. There's no multiple choice questions. So in an anatomy, anatomy test, it's four questions. For example, it will be the appendix or the brachial arteries. So what you have to do is talk about the historical, the embryology, da 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 da, da compose an essay of 10 pages. And, and then you go to American system, which is very algorithmic. You know, everything is cookbook. Very fascinating. Uh, so I wanted to do that and go back to Lebanon. And uh, so that's, so now you can see the, the interest that I had. You know, so I thought bypass, wow, this is a surgery that can cure stroke, right? What did I know? <laughs> Dave was smiling, I said, I love that smile, <laughs> right? So I went in there and I realized how little we know. And then I got interested in computational modeling. And I thought, you know, computational modeling will be the way for us to predict what we need to do. So I started working on that. And I found two guys. One was, was uh, Emmy Clark in Urbana-Champagne, because Urbana, just like it is now, but even more then, I mean, Urbana was the Cray supercomputer. Uh, remember the movie, 2001 Space Odyssey, Hale, you know, was programmed in Urbana. So, uh, so I found uh, 
Emmy Clark, who was a professor of, uh, of theoretical and applied math, modeling the oceans and the fluid dynamics of the oceans and the missiles exiting the water air interface and all that. So I want to work with him or alternatively, I want to work with this guy called Baron Hillen in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And then I said, I'll go to Utrecht because I had met Bart van der Zwan. And Bart van der Zwan is a neurosurgeon in, in the Netherlands who is now the chair there, who was a student a resident at the time, just like me that came visit us in Detroit. But as I was invited to go to the Netherlands, my mentor and chair, James Ausman, who was a, a force of nature in vascular neurosurgery, uh, decided to come to Illinois. So it was fate that ultimately tipped the scales in favor of Illinois. So I came here and I worked with engineers. I've been working with them ever since. But the interesting twist of the story and the reason I really tell it is because a few years later, these guys got lucky. Instead of having me go work with them in Utrecht, Netherlands, they find a younger, uh, smarter, marginally better looking guy. <laughs> that was David Langer. And I did not know Langer. And that's how I got eventually to know Langer because then I heard, oh, well, there's this other neurosurgeon from the US that came there and is interested in Ilana and interested in flow and all the stuff and pushing the envelope of vascular neurosurgery and bypass. His name is David Langer, David Langer, David Langer. And I keep hearing about this David Langer. So eventually through the Utrecht, Bad van der Zwan and Tulek intellection, I get to meet Dave and we hit it off. And, uh, and uh, it's a real treat to, to have known him over the years. And, uh, and we become certainly from my perspective, best friends. So that's uh, one arc of the story. And uh, look at that. What were, the, what were the things as the Lebanese, why is it there were so many Lebanese neurosurgeons and why is it, what is it about uh, that mentality of, you know, the obstacles you have to overcome. And even whether you're from, uh, you, I can you compare that to any kind of hardship. Why do you think that it appeals to the neurosurgeon? And obviously you, Jacques, Ray, there's a long list of uh, Lebanese uh, neurosurgeons. It's almost like a, a pipeline. You know, what is it about that that, that, that uh, has led to that sort of situation? You know, I think that, uh historically that part of the world had the mountain on one side and the sea on the other. And geography has been told is destiny, paraphrasing Sigmund Freud in a way, uh, where he said anatomy is destiny. But geography is destiny in a lot of ways. And, and uh, when you have no horizon, but across, across, you know, you, you got to go somewhere for those that that wanted to do something there was no choice and when one does it then it sets it shows it shows an example so uh, so i was i believe so ray sawaya was was many years before i think many years before he went to the states and then uh isam awad was the next one but isam left for the state when he was still in high school so actually he did his his high school and then his medical school here in the U.S. Uh, and and really after that I, I did it. And when and I wanted to come to the states, everybody told me you just can't do it. I mean that's not going to happen. You know, there's nobody that's trained in the French system. What do you think you're going to go there? And you got to basically cut your retreat. If you got to succeed, you got to have only forward to go. So you, you cannot because because if if the going gets tough and there's an escape route you'll try to escape. But if you cut all your escape routes and you either succeed or the worst thing will happen to you, then that, that will be another, another, um, another way to kind of force you towards success. And I did that. So I told myself I will never, ever, ever consider going back until I succeed, which was an impossible task, really. It seemed like it at the time. But once I did it, and was a few years into that, then others came in, and um, Jack can tell you the story of how, how you know. So, so it shows it shows the way directly or indirectly to other people, and more and more come. But the the main reason I think so many the brain drain, whether Lebanon or any other country, is is limited horizon, and that's what's beautiful about this country. That's 
that's what's at risk in this country, uh, in addition to the, uh, to the uh, everything that we see that's very disturbing for those of us that came from a background where we yearn for freedom, where we yearn for, where, where you have to look over your shoulder when you said something that criticizes uh, some powers, you know, because they could come and blow you up or kidnap you or blow up your family or bad things could happen. It required real physical courage to speak your mind here. It doesn't require much courage. It's taken for granted. You, can speak. you have freedom of speech. I mean, there's no country like it. And it's a concern when you see it potentially eroded or falsified. Um, but, but, but once you taste that, there's no going back. And once I came here and I tasted that, there's no going back. You, just, you can't. I mean, you, 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 you could, in your dream, in a, in a fit of nostalgia, consider going back in an environment that all you have to do is go there and land at the airport or try to conduct any kind of business, right? Rafa's laughing. <laughs> you know what we're talking about, right? Yeah. And then you say, no, you know, so luck plays a big part. Puerto Rico a little bit like that too, Rafa, for you? Well, in the, in, yes, in, in the sense that uh, I am, uh, I love uh, the lifestyle that I learned in the United States. Uh, and, and going back to what Fadi's mentioning, the, the, the way, the structure that we have in, in this country that allows all of us from different backgrounds to work together and have an enhanced product at the end that is not possible anywhere else in the world. Because anywhere else you have uniformity of, of race, of religion, of ethnicity. And here, by having people coming from different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, we can help each other to be better. And, and when you talk, think about going back to uh, living in Puerto Rico, yes, uh, like Fadi says, maybe you think about the nostalgia and the family and uh, I grew up here and that place that reminds me of my childhood. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, accomplish and, and fulfill uh, my passions uh, that I currently have in life. How about you, yourself? Yeah, I'll echo both. I mean, it's the same sentiment. I mean, at some point, you know, the U.S. does become your country. And uh, I've been here for 20 years now. And I think what we have is very unique. And we have to preserve it, hopefully. And, and, your, wife's um, and your wife's from Germany. And my wife is from Germany, exactly. So even it makes things even more complex when it comes to, you know, identity and, and seeing my kids grow up. You know, I mean, I think what we have in this country, um, and that's why I, I hope we can preserve it. And it doesn't go, you know, we don't go the wrong way, but what we have is very unique in that, you know, we can all really live in, in an environment that is very conducive to, to success. And, and hopefully we preserve that. And Jay, your parents are from Jamaica, right? Yeah, I was actually born there myself. Uh -huh. um, but I did uh, my early schooling here in the United States. So I couldn't conceive of being a neurosurgeon outside of the United States. Uh, I don't know what that would mean, but uh, I definitely appreciate um, all that this country has given to me and my family. And I think we all take that for granted, unfortunately. Maybe that's the the best part about what's going on is there's been an awareness of what's at risk and what can be lost. I, I personally wake up sometimes and I'm like, how can this possibly be happening? And, but you realize that it's a, our country is much more fragile than I think any of us had ever conceived. And uh, we, I was just with Fatty actually in February of, of this year at his ski meeting. I, I don't know if how you got, Fatty is another one of these late bloomer skiers who with the same Kind of, well, Mike Lawton's just like you too. You know, you, you guys pick up skiing as adults, which is insane. And um, Fatty is taken to this. In fact, I think there's no place he'd rather be in the winter or the summer now on his bike in the summer and then skis in the winter in steamboat. But, um, you know, we, I just thinking back that time together and where the world was there and this kind of just complete 
between COVID and our government and our government leadership and Black Lives Matter, the world is so different today than it was just a few months ago. And you can imagine that's just in a few months and uh, what could happen the longer that things go on for, who knows? Uh, I think it, it takes, you have to preserve this. This is not, it's not something, it's not God's given right to have this forever. And I think we, have, we as physicians, our leaders, uh, we have to speak up. You know, when the Black Lives Matter thing happened, I think we all struggled with the best way to express ourselves in, in a way that was respectful yet, yet firm. And uh, it, again, it was, it was uh, just going through a tremendous amount of almost a sea change in, in the country. And it's, it's been just, it's historic, but it's also scary. Uh, how are things in Chicago? And what, what did you, what was your experience? I know we spoke during the COVID, uh, you know, flare up in New York, but it seems like Chicago kind of never really uh, got to where with the fear that it might have. No, no. I mean, I really thanks to you in a way it was your, your, uh, your lot that you got it first and you got hit hard. So, I think in Chicago, they, they really tightened their, 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 they got their act together. Today, for the first day, we have zero ventilated COVID patients in the hospital. It's the first day since the we beginning. We had zero patients, period, last week. Wow. Amazing. We had 300, we competed like 325 in the middle of April. Yeah. It was nuts. Yeah. We still have today four in the ICU and 11 total, but zero ventilated, which is a, which is a milestone for us. Uh, <clears throat> So, yeah, I mean, we, I think they did a, as good a job as they can. So, Fatty, what, what kind of advice would you give uh, you yourself um, back when you were thinking about being a neurosurgeon in Lebanon that you know now? And maybe what, what, what advice would you give yourself? And at and, uh, and the same time, what, what's some, what was the, maybe your biggest failure? What was the thing that set you back the most that you overcame? Um, we all know that helps you succeed. So those are often launch points for discussing your own success. Uh, so that, that's, I think, again, I'm, this isn't just softball questions. I think that our audience, you know, this, our goal during the summer was to open ourselves up. Uh, when all the eyeballs and Netflix were on us, we knew that we'd have an opportunity to influence the uh, next generation. And so take this opportunity. I, I don't, I'm, it's not, a, we kind of have up to seven or 800 uh, people on the Insta feed at any one time. This is a you know neat opportunity. So, uh, what what would you be telling yourself? And and then what was a failure you had that made you uh, made you success successful? Yeah, that's a great question, and and I'd love to hear what each one of you has to say. So, this morning, uh, a friend of of our youngest son. Uh, Who's who's has dual citizenship? He's he has a German citizenship as well. Uh, was staying with us the last few days, and uh, because he left today back to Germany, and for many reasons. And then, uh, so as he was, I was coming leaving for work. He got up early and he wanted to say goodbye. And he asked, and I thought that he, I, I felt that maybe it was a good idea for me to give him some word of advice. And I thought I gave him the best advice that I ever read. I have it actually framed back there, that thing, like right over there, there. Uh -huh. and, and it says, uh, the advice is, uh, your life is made of two days, one day for you and one day against you, and they cycle. So if it's the day where things are going your way, don't get cocky. And if it's day where things are going against you, don't despair because it will, because it too will pass. And, and I thought that was uh, a good thing that I did this morning. I felt good about myself. I don't know why I told him that, but I thought it was a good thing to say. He was going through a lot in his personal life. Uh, his parents, it's like, it was big turmoil and making a big move. And I think that's something that uh, if I were to go back, if I had come across this earlier and apply it, kind of like the, the, you know, the arrow thing, uh, kind of apply it, you know, just, just try and maintain uh, this emotional mean, you know, as much as possible and, and keep it in context, uh, then life flows smoother.
I, I, I have a question, Fadi. Uh, for people that don't know, Dr. Professor Charbel, uh, on top of being a great leader, uh, the chairman of a department, an amazing, well-renowned uh, uh, vascular neurosurgeon, he's also an inventor. And uh, for, for us and for the people listening, how did the inventions of the flow probe and uh, the quantitative uh, uh, MRA NOVA come about? And what advice would you give young people and young doctors, if they have an idea, how should they execute it? What should be that first step to really take it to the next level? So that's, uh, I think, going to be a very gratifying part to what you do as a, as a young person going into medicine. Because if there's one thing that, that's being, that becoming more and more apparent is the way we taught medicine or learned medicine for the last hundred years has not changed all that a lot. It's bound to change enormously now. I mean, look what you guys are doing uh, from playback health, from the communication with patients, transmission transmission of information, uh, what you're doing now, uh, there's no doubt that that's going to change. So it, it, the, the invention part comes, people talk about, uh, is there such a thing as, an, as, a, as a born innovator? Maybe. Uh, but, but I think it's always really, we do what we do uh, in response to the, to the thought that that's what we need to do at the time we do it. It's kind of a long phrase, but if you think about it, it sums it all. People do what they do in response, and that's a key part because it's always a reaction. It's, I don't think there's a free generated born such and such. It's always a reaction to an external environment, conscious or conscious, you know, proximate or remote in time, but something sets you up to, to do the next step. And for me, of course, I told you the, the, main, the main driver, uh, but once I started to wanna solve this problem and, and one thing leads to another. So everything that I developed was because I wanted to solve a problem and then it comes practical and then maybe it's commercial product and maybe people will use it. But that was never the primary thing. I never started off saying, well, I wanna do something because it'll be a great commercial thing and I'll make money on it. That's not, that's not how I did it. There's nothing wrong with that. And that may be the smart way to go about it. <laughs> but, but that's not how I did it. I did it because I was doing an experiment and I was using an electromagnetic flow meter. That meter was a bear and required contact. And it would tear up the vessels. And I wanted something that did not require contact, that did not tear up the vessel. And I looked at this technology, a transit time ultrasound, and I did that. And then I was doing another experiment where I needed to validate a computational model. I needed to find a way to measure the blood flow. And how do we do it if we don't open the person up to put the probe around them? And then you find that in the MR, there's a sequence called face contrast MR. So we had to develop software, raise money, form a company so we can get there. And that's how that came about and, and so forth. So it was really always, uh, the reason behind it is there's a, a, a clinical question, something that that needed improvement and uh, the research uh, demanded some innovation and, uh, and I did that roughly. But you guys have a lot of stories too. So please do share. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, 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 today's your day. So we're, we're obviously very excited to have you join us. And, and then another question that, that comes uh, to mind a lot for young uh, uh, doctors uh, that are interested in neurosurgery and that like vascular neurosurgery. If you were to start yeah. your residency today, uh, would you be a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon, number one? Uh, and or would you look for a dual trained program of endovascular and open vascular, or would you be doing something different? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's not a very difficult one. Uh, being an open, a, a non-dual train is, 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 is a non-starter. Is a non-starter. I mean, that's just, uh, 
That's the worst. I've had a very, very bad idea. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's starting right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, you We've know. had this discussion, Fatty and I. I know yeah. what you're going to say. And you better say what you've told me. <laughs> what did I tell you? I'll be very upset. What is it? What did I say? You want to be, a, you'd be a tumor surgeon. You'd be yes. The yeah. I was going to say, so I, I'm going to say it because <laughs> if actually I'm starting all over again right now, I would not do cerebrovascular. I would do uh, neuro-oncology because, because I think there's, there's much more opportunity in, in un, unconquered terrain when it comes to uh, research questions and things of, the, of that nature. Uh, but way beyond that, really, I mean, for the young guys that are thinking of career in medicine, not even residency yet, a career in medicine, uh, the future of medicine is two things, is AI and robotics. And if you don't acquire the, the if you don't learn the alphabet, at least, if not the language, but a minimum, the alphabet of that, we're doing a huge disservice. Uh, there's very few medical schools, if any, that are, that are, that are that we're still training our, our, our medical students using memorization. I mean, why on earth do you need to memorize anatomy and things like that when you can, in the near future, if not right now, recall that stuff instantly in front of you, it could be floating in front of you, it could overlay, that, that, that's not what's important. The cognitive part of that is going to be all that. I mean, uh, today, actually, I'm starting a course for our residents that I'm putting together, I put together with our, with our, uh, with our engineering school, an AI course. It's going to be a four months introduction. Uh, every week, there's a, there's a lecture, there's a, there's a homework. It's going to require... Can you join? Yeah, you can, if you want, I'll send you the link. Where's the link? And, and there has to be a capstone project at the end. And eventually we'll build it into a degree, perhaps with a residency. That's my biggest concern is that we are training, we are training for something that may not, may not be what it is in the future. It's Patty, I know you were teasing me about being, nor that I was describing myself. That is exactly what a North Star person does. Is that you're, you know, you're, you're the type of guy that you're never, you never sit still. You don't have to do that. You've been doing, you I mean, you're, you're top of the food chain. You've got a great department, got a great career, and you're always thinking about what's coming next. And, and you know, that's, that's what you have to do. I mean, Mike, my, my, I think you just gave the advice to your younger self is you always have to think ahead. You know, I think that what COVID taught us is the risk of, of high risk, low probability events. You know, yeah, you can go, you can go be an open vascular surgeon if you want, but that's pretty high risk. You know, it, it's it's and it's high probability that it's not going to work. It's what you love to do. You know, just recognize that that you have to prepare. You know, have other another side to you. And if you're, you know, you want to do what you love to do, um, but by the same token, don't be you know stu don't don't be aware that the world's going to look very different when you're sitting in Dr. Charbel's seat. Uh, in, in, in 40 years than it does right now. And uh, so that's, that's the whole point. You know, you're, you're thinking of the next step. I mean, I agree with you about AI. The question is what, how to, as a neurosurgeon, how to use it, how to get trained. And if I was a medical student right now or an undergraduate student or a high school student, I think that's where you, you want to look to those areas of becoming expert in. And um, it's like when we were in medical schools, like molecular biology or you know, something like that was, was the thing. Well, I don't, I think that IT and AI is really where the excitement's going to be. You know, with, with playback, I kind of got that idea 10 years, 10, 15 years ago, but still we are, we're still behind. Like no one really cares yet. But I think those sorts of things are going to be valuable in the next generation. And uh, you have to, you have to really know what's coming. And, and, you know, like Gretzky says, skate where the puck is going. That, that's really, that's really the key. So, so that's the best advice, what you just said. And that story, like say playback, you know, if you, I mean, you've been thinking about it for a long time, it's been percolating. It takes a, lot, a, lot, a long time to do something that's truly non-incremental. Incremental, you can do that. But if something non-incremental, so I, mean, I know there's a lot of young people that may not even have considered going and may not even started medicine or very early in their career. 
one of the best way to look at the future is an intercept. You, you got to plot an intercept. You got to plot an intercept curve. You, you got to be like, uh, you know, if, if you know, the, the surface to air missile doesn't chase the plane, you'll never catch it. Okay. What it does is the plane is going this way and that missile is going to go here and they'll, and they'll intercept. Okay. So you got to plot an intercept curve. It, so, but, so it's a, there's a guess. So you're going to think where the future is going to be. You're going to plot your intercept. For a while, what will happen? People will say, what the hell are you talking about? Nobody want to hear about what you're saying. I remember when I first started and I submit papers about computational modeling and face contrast MR and things like that. Nobody wanted to hear about that stuff. And then, so that went for about 10 years. So for the last 10 years and going forward, I, you know, the, I can't keep up the invitation of people to, for me to come and talk, right? So you get there, you intercept, you ride that curve for a while, but then it's gonna diverge again. So, so you really gotta think maybe of, a, of yet another intercept. But if you don't plot an intercept to think that you're gonna catch technology, let's see what's happening today. And that field is already there and booming and I'm gonna become an expert in that and be the king of the hill. No, that's not, that's not, that's not realistic. I agree with you. I, I wanna, with our last uh, eight minutes, this turns off automatically on Insta, uh, not on Zoom, but I, I wanted to just say one more thing and then I'll, I'm gonna stop talking and leave it up to you guys about the arrow concept that Fatty basically invented or thought of. I actually tweeted during this, uh, during this session um, that you're the ultimate arrow in my mind and that uh, when going to failure and being an arrow is something um, that I think about a lot. And in fact, the measure of a man and the measure of friendship is someone you can call for, you know, about anything. And, you know, I, the last, two weeks ago, I had like probably one of the worst complications of my life. And the first person I called other than my partners was fatty. Um, because, but you need this, that's what you need to have in order to, you know, to really be successful and to, to, to make it, you have to have people who are your mentors, your confidants, your, your, you have to manage up sideways and down. And, uh, to, to fatty, that's what you are to me. You're, you're that, that person that I can, you know, call when I need you to laugh, to cry, to, you know, to get your opinion. And, uh, and like I said, so what well, fatty's arrow concept is that you're, we're, we only can be so good. We can sharpen our tip. We can spend hours and hours and the 10,000 hour rule sharpen a tip, or you can, you know, make sure the feathers are totally lined up and totally in the right trajectories that the, the, the arrow goes straight. And, but ultimately when you put the arrow in the bow and you pull back, you have to let it go and you don't always hit the center of the target. It doesn't mean the arrow is not perfect. It's just that you don't hit the center of the target every time. And I think it's going back to your point of you got, you have ups and downs and it's the same things, but all you can do is make your work to make yourself better. And I think you are really exempt, an exemplar of that in our business. I, I don't know that I know anybody that's done that better than you. And um, with that, I, you know, I just turn it over to you guys uh, to offer your, your final thoughts or, and then leave it up to fatty for the last couple of minutes. Jay, you've been, you're always so talkative, Jay. I don't know, you know, why don't you say, <laughs> Well, I, just regarding, uh, I guess, failure, that was one of the questions that came up. One of the days that was sort of most demoralizing to me was when I was, uh, I was a PGY2, and I'd gone to the first cerebrovascular section conference, and um, my chairman, uh, Bob Solomon, was being honored at that uh, conference, and he invited me to dinner with him and we were chatting and I said, Dr. Solomon, I really want to do what you do. I want to be an open vascular surgeon. I want to do all the big cases. This is what I want to be. And he said, Jason, you can't do what I do. He essentially said, I'm a dinosaur and you don't want to train to be a dinosaur. You can't do this. Go do endovascular. And that was kind of one of the worst days of my life because <laughs> I really wanted to do what Bob Solomon did. Anyway, I did take his advice. I, um, I spent some time in the endovascular suite and I, uh, 
I tried to learn that stuff and I would, I just wasn't as excited as I thought I should be. And so I, um, you know, I went on to do more training. I trained with Dan Barrow and I called Dr. Langer up and Dr. Langer said, I got a job for you. And, uh, so that was, uh, kind of how I ended up here. But, uh, yeah, I think if you just follow your passions, whatever it may be, I think uh, things will work out. So that's kind of my story. You should have been a brain tumor surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> He's really a good shunt surgeon. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, for, you know, we have yeah, talking about in the back. Fatty, I, I, I just saw my email, I think this morning, <clears throat> a short interview uh, that you gave a uh, link in Chicago. They asked you the question. Um, it was very coincidental because we had this, you know, uh, webinar with you today. So I thought it was funny. But the question they asked you was, what, what did you think was going to be the future of interventional, you know, neuroradiology? And, and you gave like a two minute answer, which I thought was interesting. I wanted to hear it from you now. You talked about how the field needs to walk into the more quantitative things and how we should start thinking of fusing more advanced imaging in the ANJA suite. And you even mentioned, I think, how we should have an MRI machine probably in the ANJA suite, which obviously could be quite a challenge given the magnet and so on. But, but I want to get your, you know, your thoughts on the last few minutes of, of what do you think is going to be the future for neurointervention? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rafael. Obviously, I don't know for sure what the future is, but if I were to, to do something in that direction, again, along that intersect curve, <clears throat> somehow I would put, I would put some chips on MR interventional environment. Uh, and the reason for that is this, close, is this short and close feedback loop <clears throat> that you get that's more physiological than the anatomical feedback loop that we get from the uh, angiographic imaging. I know right now there's a lot of research going on on, on MRI fluoroscopy. There are little cottage industries about catheters that, are, that you can use in the MR, that are even visible in the MR. It's not inconceivable that, that the MR could become the platform for intervention in addition to, to, to the diagnostic and physiological imaging. So I could conceive of a scenario where you can do in addition to all the other things, you can do some specific imaging in MR to inform you on the result of intervention to stop at the right time, not more, not less, I mean, and, and et cetera. I don't know everything, but, but directionally, that's what I, would, what I would invest myself right now in. And it won't be all or none. Obviously, it'll be graduated. You know, Andrew is here, MR is here, and progressively, you know, it will do that. David, you're muted. Roth, you want to wrap it up? So, Fadi, uh, we, we have interacted a few times, uh, and every time has been a complete uh, pleasure to be spending time with you. Uh, I always learn uh, when I spend time with you, but even uh, equally important, uh, I feel close to you because uh, you are such good friends with David, and he always speaks so highly uh, mm -hmm. of, of the way you think, of the way you feel that I do feel that, uh, that you're next to me and that we are best friends. So thank you for spending time here. I'm honored and uh, I can tell you how touched I am that uh, uh, to hear what you said and what David has been way too generous uh, with his words and with his friendship and, and it goes both ways. Um, so thanks brother. See you in Steamboat. Okay. Thank Bye, you. Zan. Thank you guys. very much for having me. What are your wife? Is Ann still there? There. Hi. <laughs> That's a nice right. office, by the way. What's that, <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We Bye. had about 79 people watching, and everyone really enjoyed it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay. So long. Bye, guys. Bye.